Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, chapter 28, um, verses 1 to 6 and 15 to 19. Listen now for God's word to us. Moses said, if you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all God's commandments that I am commanding you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. But if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all God's commandments and decrees that I am commanding you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Reverend Barb. This morning, we are finishing a series of sermons that have been examining the Apostles' Creed, line by line. We began this long pilgrimage back in May with the first word of the Creed, and today we end it with the final word, Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to refresh this Apostles' Creed in your mind and in your voice by saying it with me. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. That word, amen, might be the most common word in all the vocabularies of Judaism and Christianity. It is a word spoken in 70 different languages. It has been spoken for thousands and thousands of years. Farther back than the historical record can reach, the word amen has been on the lips of humankind. So it might surprise you this morning to learn that nobody knows precisely what it means. It is one of the great mysteries of language. This word has been kept in widespread use for thousands of years without a definition because it has a particular ritual function that no other word can replace. It is the word that ends every prayer. 
prayer. Modern dictionaries have attempted to reconstruct the meaning of amen, and they speculate from context that it means something like, so be it. But in truth, it is a word that cannot be defined. It is more like a smile or a sigh. The word is a part of human expression that goes deeper than language can touch. So I'm not going to tell you this morning what amen means. It is a mystery, and mysteries are not problems to be solved. Mysteries are meant to lure us out of what we know and lead us into previously unimaginable vistas of wonder and beauty. So let us attempt this New Year's morning to bring this most ancient mystery to life. I'm going to tell you this morning briefly about two explanations, two for the meaning and origin of amen, which I find very interesting. And then I'm going to tell you something about this word, which I know to be true for this church today. The first interesting explanation about the origin of amen is an explanation from grammar. By all accounts, this word originated in Hebrew. And so if you look at the way that it was used in the most ancient compositions of the Hebrew scriptures, you will see that it occurs in dialogues between two people, and it is used in a particular way as a confirmatory response. Somebody say confirmatory response. Confirmatory response. Amen. One person says something, and the other person, second person, agrees. And so he says, amen. For example, Jacob said to Esau, would you like ketchup on your hot dog? And Esau replied, amen, meaning, yes, I want ketchup on my hot dog. Because Esau was not from Chicago, and he did not understand that ketchup on a hot dog is an abomination unto the Lord. But this is very strange, because the most common time that people use this word amen is when they are praying between themselves and God. This is a one-way communication, you praying to God. There is nothing to agree with unless you're agreeing with and confirming yourself, which would be absurd. So have we been using amen the wrong way this entire time? I don't think so. I don't think so because Paul and the psalmists and even Jesus himself use amen at the end of prayer. So we're in good company, and we have precedent for using it this way. But it is still very strange. What is the confirmatory response when we say amen? The only possible explanation is that our private prayers are not actually one way as we might think. Whether or not you ever thought of it before, whenever you say amen, you are making a claim that you are not alone in the dialogue of your prayers. God prays back. In the space of time between your last word and the first A in amen, God has already answered you. And in saying amen, you are responding in confirmation to God's answer whether or not you are aware that you heard it, whether or not that answer is what you want it to be. This is the dangerous thing about praying. We tell God what we want, and then God tells us what God wants. And in our response, when we say amen, we are accepting that what God wants for us is better than what we want for ourselves. Amen is a surrender to God's will, even and especially when it is different from our own will. I like to think that God also speaks in the space between the end of the creed we just said and the time that we say amen. I like to think that God fills in all the gaps of what we don't know of what we doubt, and of what we misunderstand. It's not our job to get it perfect. We simply affirm our faith together the best we can, and God fills in the rest. Amen. 
So that's the first interesting explanation of what amen means. The second interesting explanation comes from mysticism. Jewish mysticism is very concerned with numbers in the Bible. And the Bible is full of numbers. In fact, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value. And the rabbis like to add them up and explore all the new dimensions of meaning that emerge from the sums of the numbers. That Hebrew word, amen, is composed of three letters, aleph, mem, and nun. The alphanumeric value of aleph is one. The alphanumeric of mem is 40, and nun is 50. Somebody help me with the math. 50 plus 40 plus 1 equals what? 91. 91. Thank you. 91 doesn't seem like a very auspicious or interesting number right now, but it's going to become very interesting in a couple of minutes, I promise. So we need somebody to write this number down so we don't forget it. Who can write down the number 91? I can do that. Thank you, Marilyn. Some of the most profound and important numbers in the Bible are the numbers that emerge when we add up the letters in the names of God. And God has many, many names in the Bible. But there are two names which are more common than all the rest. And the first one is the Tetragrammaton. Somebody say Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Amen. The second one is Adonai. Somebody say Adonai. Adonai. The Tetragrammaton is the four letters which spell out the personal name of God. They are unspeakable, but sometimes you will see the letters written out as Y-H-W-H. In Hebrew, the letters are yod He vav He. This is translated in our Bibles as LORD in all capital letters. This name of God is especially set apart because it's said to contain the very essence of God. To speak it out loud is disgraceful because God's essence cannot be contained or confined within human language. The Tetragrammaton names the aspect of God which is heavenly, which transcends the world and all human knowledge and theology and understanding. This aspect of God cannot be boxed in by our dogma or even by our imaginations. The alphanumerics for the Tetragrammaton are 10 for Yod, 5 for He, 6 for Vav, and another 5 for the other, for the other He. Somebody help me. 10 plus 5 plus 6 plus 5 equals? 26. 26. Very good. We need somebody to write that down so we won't forget it. Barb. Thank you, Reverend Barb. The other most common name for God in the Bible is Adonai, and it means my sovereign Lord. Y-H-W-H is translated Lord in all capital letters, and Adonai is translated as Lord with a capital L and lowercase o-r-d. It's interesting to compare these names for God. If the Tetragrammaton is God's heavenly aspect, then Adonai is God's worldly aspect. It refers to the presence of God as king and ruler over everything that exists. I heard one rabbi say that Adonai refers to the aspects of God which are not potential, but actual. This is God as God has been made known to us in our theology and in our doctrines. This is God in history, God in three dimensions. In Hebrew, the letters of Adonai are Aleph, Dalet, Nun, and Yod. Help me with the math. I didn't major in it. Aleph is one, Dalet is four, Nun is fifty, and Yod is 10. So that's 50 plus 10 plus 4 plus 1. What does it equal? 65. 65. Excellent. I think I hear there's an, an, another treasure out there. Who can write this one down for us? Gabriel, thank you. 
Okay, this is where it's all going to come together. Reverend Barb, can you remind us what the alphanumeric sum of the tetragrammaton is? 26. 26. Gabriel, can you remind us what the alphanumeric sum of Adonai is? 65. 26 plus 65 equals? 91. And Marilyn, can you remind us what other Hebrew word has the alphanumeric sum of 91? Amen. Amen. What does this mean? It means that when we say amen, we are combining in one word the heavenly aspect of God and the worldly aspect of God. Because we experience God as divided in this way, as present and yet removed, in the world and yet transcendent, limited and yet infinite, knowable and yet also ineffable. This simple word, amen, allows us to address the totality of God. It is as if to say, may heaven and earth be combined for us, which is the heart of every prayer. We pray because we recognize that there is something we need or want in our experience which is not with us, yet we know that in heaven, all that we want and need is fulfilled completely. So we ask for heaven and earth to be one. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in this mystical explanation, the word amen becomes a powerful wonder and a miracle. For the space of two syllables, we combine heaven and earth and make them one. It's as if we were praying for fire and then struck a flint. That word amen is the spark that will set the world ablaze with the kingdom of God. So there you have two explanations for the origin and meaning of amen, one from grammar and one from mysticism. And they teach us on one hand to listen as we pray for God to answer and to take seriously the dynamic power of our prayers. Now I have one more thing this morning to say about the word amen, something special for this church as we begin this new year together. Amen is an agreement. We say it to affirm that something is true, and there's a lot of power in agreement. If somebody tells you that you are beautiful and you agree, you'll be happy when you look in the mirror. If somebody tells you that you are lovable and you agree, then you'll discover that you are loved. But if you were ever told that you were ugly or worthless or stupid, and if you ever agreed, Lord have mercy, you will find yourself seeming more and more those ways to yourself. Even though it's not true, Yet thinking makes it true. And that is how the world is laid out for us. There is always a yes alongside a no. The word of God and the slander of the devil. The word of love and the word of death. And in our scripture this morning, it talked about this in the language of blessings and curses. If you glance back at that scripture in your bulletins, you will notice that the blessings are identical to the curses. God says that if you do what I am telling you to do, if you live the way I am telling you to live, <coughs> these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed in work and in family and in community. But God also says that if you do not do what I say, you will be cursed in all the same things. And this is the choice that is set before us every moment and every day and every year. Will we choose the blessing or the curse? Now, I don't want you to be confused. God is not blessing us if we are good and cursing us if we are bad. That's not what I'm saying, because we don't have that power over God's actions. God is going to do what God is going to do. God is going to make the sun shine or God is going to make it rain. 
God is going to bring to life, and God is going to return that life to ashes and the grave. God is going to bring fun and laughter, and God is going to bring challenge and hardship. God is going to do what God is going to do. The question is whether it is a blessing or a curse. Now, the rain is a curse if you're upset about it, but it's a blessing if you dance in it. The sunshine is a curse if you wanted clouds, but it's a blessing if you receive it as a blessing. Even the struggles and the pain that we experience in life can be blessings or curses, depending on one thing, where we put our amen. If someone says to you that your life is terrible and you ought to be miserable, and you say amen, then your life becomes a curse. This is what Job's friends were doing when he said, they said, curse God and die. But if somebody points out to you the abundance in your life and all that you have to be grateful for, and you say amen, then the same life is a blessing. Don't get me wrong here. It's good, I truly believe, to complain sometimes. It's good to want things to change, to be better than they are. There are blessings in all of that. Just as there is a curse in folk keeping other folk down by saying that they've got the best they're going to get. Your job is to tell the difference between what is going to build you up and what is going to tear you down. And to say amen to the blessings and to tell the curses where they can go. It is God's will to build us up, sometimes through comforts and other times through challenges. And as we begin this new year together, First Church, it is time to state our powerful and strong amens in the Lord our God who will build us up and make us prosper. I do not know if it is God's will for this church to gain a thousand members or for us to keep the mighty 34 saints that we've got. I don't know which is the blessing and which is the curse. I don't know if it's God's will for us to raise $10 million or if it's God's will for us to scrape by another year. What I do know is that God's will for this church is a blessing and not a curse. And so, too, whatever God has in store for us this year, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. There are those who say that this church is too small. We do not say amen. There are those who say that this church's building problems are too large, and we do not say amen. There are those who say you can never raise enough money, and we do not say amen. There are those who say that this church's best days are history, and we do not say amen. There are those who say that we should just give up and sell out and close down. We do not say amen. There are many who set out curses before this church like stumbling stones, but we reserve our sacred affirmations. The truth is that if God wanted this church to fail, it would have failed a long time ago. If it had not been for God on our side, this church would long be forgotten. Yet this church has persisted through civil war, through fires and floods, through splits and mergers, through violence, through programs that they said no respectable church ought to do, through police raids and congressional hearings, through administrative commissions, which we love and are grateful for, through every manner of every kind of curse. If it had not been for God on our side, there would be no First Presbyterian Church of Chicago. And yet here at the beginning of 2023, 190 years after our ancestors first gathered for prayer at a meeting in a carpentry shop in Fort Dearborn, this church has been brought from death into new birth, 
with a calling to be a new kind of church for Woodlawn and for the world. And so I ask you, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Every single day, I see the blessings and the curses rain down on this church. I am not exaggerating when I tell you that there are miracles happening in this church on a daily basis. And members of that administrative council persisting in the life of this church. And Mark Johnson showing up to say, let me clean your church. And Art Perkins showing up to say, let me restore your church. And Marilyn showing up to say, let me be treasurer year after year. And Session standing up and say, we will lead this church. And Sherry standing up and say, I will lead the editorial team of the Chimes. And Michelle standing up and saying, I will lead an equity book discussion group. And all the new life. And Dozy showing up and saying, I will begin a rest. I will continue my restaurant in this church, and all of you showing up for church today, there are miracles. I don't know if I even believed in miracles before I came here, but now I've seen too many to deny them. And you should also know, people of God, that alongside these daily miracles, I see daily assaults and curses. And so we must be strong and courageous and place our amens in the only God who is strong to save us. Because if we are still here, day after day, people of God, that can only mean one thing. God has a purpose for us. God has a will for First Church in Chicago. We are humbly caught up in a great thing that God is doing with us. So let the church say, Amen. Amen. And to all who say God is reviving this church for a purpose, let the church say, Amen. Amen. And to all who encourage us and partner with us, let the church say, Amen. And to those who invest their time and their money and their vision in that God, in the vision that God has placed on this church, let the church say, Amen. Amen. And to all who say God has brought us this far by faith and God will lead you on. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. 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 Amen.